you familiar with Robert's work already. He is a Woodside native. He's regarded as a master photographer and his work graces the walls of the village pub, our own town hall, as well as a variety of other places, including Stanford University's Medical Center, collections of the Yale University Art Museum, Santa Barbara Museum of Art, Apple Computer, Gentech, Adobe, Xerox, and Nikon. And Robert has some of his work available here, and he'll be telling you about that in his presentation. He's also the author of four award-winning books of his photographs, and has enjoyed artist residencies at the Santa Fe Institute, Stanford University, and the Jurassic Resident Artist Program here in Woodside. He's published 16 portfolios in his 40 plus years of work, and tonight he's gonna to be sharing his journey and his experience. Now, one of the things that I heard someone say when they were viewing Robert's work is that there are no people in the picture. And one thing that we brought that to my attention when that person said that, I was fortunate enough to know Ansel Adams, and Ansel Adams had the same thing where people often said that about his work. And so he would always remind the person that when he takes a photograph, there are actually two people in every image. There's the photographer, and there's the person viewing the photograph. So with that, here's Robert, and I hope you enjoy his work, and thank you again for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for being here. We're facing stiff competition with the orange and black tonight. And, uh, really appreciate your making the time to come out. Um, so, I want to thank the Woodside Arts and Culture Committee for the opportunity. And uh, tonight I'm going to take a very personal perspective about my work. Uh, usually I talk technically. I talk aesthetically, I speak historically about the creation of photography in the early 1800s up to the present time. This is the first time I've actually told my story, and most importantly, the profound influence that living here in Woodside uh, has made on my work. So, let's dive into it. Oh. Photography is the language of life. And like every language, it has its own syntax, structure, vocabulary, and grammar. I've spent the last four decades of my life inquiring into that language to learn what I could and to share its truth with others. I believe my best work expresses that which cannot be said, but upon which I find it impossible to remain silent. It all started here in Woodside. <laughs> Here's my family at 275 Landing Drive, my sister Anne on the left, myself, my wonderful mother, my younger sister Lisa, and my sister Jane. Those were happy days and a very different time. As you can see from this cover article from the 1959 <laughs> Redwood City Tribune, I was born a child of royalty. <laughs> and as any decent history book will tell you, the world was never the same. <laughs> Certainly, my world was never the same. To have the privilege of riding down the horse carriage on Woodside Road, something I'll never forget. You can take a look at some of the names here. We've got uh, families that are still here. We've got the, uh, uh, the uh, Dickies, the Quists. Uh, the Roberts, the Dennises. It was a very special time, and those families are still among our friends. One of the earliest memories I had was the raising of the forest outside my family's home to make way for Interstate 280. I believe at the time I was in sixth or seventh grade, and my parents at the time were concerned because I was so traumatized over it. The forest that reached from Landing Drive to the hills where Kenyatta College stand now were my territory. That's where me and my friends would go. That's where we saw tortoises and snakes. 
And I was too young to understand that I couldn't own everything. But I wasn't blind to the fact that there are things that you can lose in this life that you can never recover. That seed of indignation and outrage over the raising of that forest has lived in my heart ever since. Little would I have imagined that decades later I would make this image, 280 Sunrise, as an homage, a loving homage, to man's place in the world. At the same time, I was in the process of becoming the assistant senior patrol leader of Troop 159 right here in Woodside. <laughs> and from this very stage, when this building was over on Albion, across from the school, I led the Boy Scout trip in the 1960s. Here we've got the Philip Browns and Harry Dennis and uh, my dear friend Scott George, who passed away a few months ago, and uh, raising a soda in celebration of the Sierras. It was those times it, with Boy Scouts in the Sierras that I really, my love of the land began to emerge and crystallize. Sleeping under the starry canopy of uh, stars at night, <laughs> the peace and quiet, the solitude. Even as a young man, I knew that I had heard the call of something very special, but I was unable to put words or action to it. From that time on, I continually looked for ways to return to the mountains. Years later, in 1988, I would make this photograph, Arcularius Ranch. I work to imbue my photographs with as much life as I can. Earth, air, and water, life and death, endings and beginnings. And in this particular example, as well as the 280 image, yin and yang, Forces that often appear in opposition, but are in fact demonstrations of our interconnectedness, not just with each other, but with the natural world. <coughs> Bag boy at Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> we were a very old fashioned family, I'm proud to say. For my family, having a job was not a good idea or a suggestion. It was a, d a demonstration of your commitment to yourself, to be useful, and also to be part of your community. My first job when I was, four was, when I was 14, and I worked over here at what used to be the Shell Station and is now the Remax Gold Office. The man that owned it was a World War II veteran by the name of Stubby. So everybody knew it was Stubby Shell Station. And my job at the age of 14 was unusual. My job was to sit in the back and do nothing and talk to no one unless a woman or a person of color came into the gas station and then that was my job to fill their tank with gas because the stubby felt that was beneath him. So this was an education, this was an education that I didn't get from my family at home. But I love that job and I got to start getting to know the people here in this town. When I was 16, I got my job with Roberts, and uh, look, look at that 27-foot Cadillac right there going up there. <laughs> Remember those days? So it was a very special thing, and, and, and by the time I left for college, I knew every single family in this town, and every single family in this town knew me. And at the time, I thought that it was that way for everyone, that everyone had a community that everyone knew each other and everyone knew their kids. It was a very special, uh, a special thing and something that has benefited me my entire lifetime. I left home in the fall of 72 to attend the University of Colorado. Here I am posing in front of the only two cars my parents owned that I hadn't yet crashed. <laughs> and uh, I had the previous summer gotten my soaring license to fly power, uh, powerless aircraft in uh, Germany, got my soaring license, and was well on the way to getting my powered license, and was going to Colorado to study aeronautical engineering with a dream of becoming the second Robert Biltman, like my father on the right there, the chief pilot worldwide for Pan American. On the first year I was in college, I was uh, scared to death. 
you know, I went to the school, uh, elementary school, with the same 28 children for eight years, most of us going to kindergarten <clears throat> before that. And when I went to the University of Colorado with 5,000 new freshmen, I quickly learned the limitations of my education, my social skills, and my courage. Uh, the first year was rough. When I came back, uh, I worked over the summer. And uh, just before I was leaving, a friend owed me some money, couldn't pay me, uh, decided to settle the debt with a camera he had. I'd never had a camera, as I told him at the time. I want your damn camera, I want my money, <laughs> and I got the camera instead. So as I was traveling, uh, driving to Colorado, I was visiting friends in Cottonwood Canyon in the Wasatch Mountains of Utah, and as I lifted the camera to my eye and beheld this tableau, I had the first truly transcendental experience of my life. I saw everything that I had ever done everything that I would ever be in that moment. And in that moment, a new path for my life opened. A lot of people ask me, what, what is this? What is it about your photographs? What is it about nature? And I think it's a very fundamental thing because it seems to cross races, gender, education, age, as Janine Benyus wrote, for 99% of the time we've been here, we were hunters and gatherers. Our lives depended on knowing the fine, small details of our world. Deep inside, we still have a longing to be reconnected with the nature that shaped our imagination, our language, our art, our song and dance, and our sense of the divine. This longing can be expressed in a number of ways, in music, in science, poetry, religion, but for me, I found my greatest fulfillment in the simple task of making photographs. It seems to me that the only thing, of, uh, the only real value in art is the part that you can't talk about, the part that defies our language. And I like photographs that suggest or, or imply the presence of a profound sense of beauty, the wonder of being alive, and most importantly, the unfathomable mystery of being that lives in all of us. That is what I reach for in every photograph I make. I made this one, Sierra in Spring, in 1974, and I regard it as my first successful effort at landscape photography. And as I began my new education in photography, I had to support myself like we all do. So I worked at various odd jobs and was always looking to work with a camera. Or in, in my early years, I had the privilege of working for a man who was truly a giant at that time, Charlie Wright. He wrote the two million copy bestseller, The Greeting of America. And he, would, he had had some surgery, and so I took care of him over a summertime, cooked and cleaned and did all those things. What I loved about Charlie was, and, and those of you I can see were reasonably, of a reasonable age in here, we all remember the 1960s. We rem remember the conversation. This was either America going to hell in a handbasket, or this was a new beginning. And it was Charlie's book that really looked at this from a unique perspective. He wrote with passion, for one almost convinced that it was necessary to accept ugliness and evil, that it was necessary to be a miser of dreams. The 1960s were an invitation either to laugh or to cry. For one who thought the world was irretrievably encased in metal and plastic and sterile stone, the 1960s were a veritable greeting of America. Charlie's prediction of a glorious and enlightened future, almost none of it came true, but it inspired me profoundly and gave me an unreasonable optimism that no matter how bad things look, that it is all a process, that it's all an evolution. In 1976, I went to work with the world-renowned Morton Beebe, the photographer in San Francisco, who purchased the Image Bank 
which was the world's largest stock photography agency. Now remember, this is pre-digital. So we had millions of 35 millimeter slides mm -hmm. in sleeves in a room twice the size of this one filled with file cabinets. And customers would call and say, I'm doing an ad and I need a picture of a baby or I need a picture of whatever. We would find it for them. We had the idea, Mort and I did, that maybe we could be selling these images for large photographic reproductions and work with the architects and designers and so on. So this is my first major project. This is the Bay Bridge partially completed. I made an eight by 40 foot canvas mural, stretched it over stretcher bars. This still hangs in their headquarters at 45 Beale Street in San Francisco. Part of the joy of that work was be being able to run my fingers through photographs made by the greatest photographers in the world at the time. It was an incredibly inspiring opportunity. At the same time, I did a lot of freelance work. I've always been a lover of automobiles, uh, like my father and my grandfather who worked for General Motors. So I got the contract to shoot all the races at Sears Point, Laguna Seca, and Riverside for the International Motorsports Association. This was manna from heaven, let me tell you. I honed my skills sufficiently that in 1979, I was hired by Scuderia Ferrari, the racing division of the luxury Italian car maker to photograph the Formula One races in North America. So I had Long Beach and uh, uh, Montreal. Here, the late great Gilles Neal, uh, Villeneuve rounding the hairpin at Long Beach. Those races were unbelievable. You talk about the 1%. <laughs> Sitting at a bar one night in Montreal, there was this guy with an English accent next to me. It was late, so one or two in the morning, and I said, you look familiar to me. I said, what's your name? George. What's your last name? Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me, and we both laughed, and I said, hey, yeah, you're one of them Beatle guys, aren't you? <laughs> it was pretty wonderful. Later on, I built my own business doing photo murals sold it in partnership to a company in Newport Beach, so we had national reach. We started doing projects like this, the Muppets office in New York City. This reproduction was on inch deep pile, uh, pile carpet. It's quite beautiful. And this project, the Henry Mayo Newhall Hospital in Southern California, this is a four story tall, eight foot wide light box showing the work of the photographer Joey Fisher. Working with these architects and designers was just a whole new world for me. And I discovered all kinds of talents and skills I, that I was not aware of. Here is a project in Chop, one of Chop Keenan's buildings down at 400 Hamilton Street. This piece titled Refugio Ranch. This is an eight by eight foot silver gelatin print. Owing largely to my mother, I had a pretty strong social conscience. And uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, I did several years pro bono work for the Breakthrough Foundation. Breakthrough Foundation worked uh, to rehabilitate young men in the California Youth Authority. So these were juveniles that were too dangerous to put on the street and who had committed the worst of crimes. I spent two years of my life watching these young men grow and develop and reclaim themselves. And all I can tell you, it was, it was quite an education for this boy from Woodside. However, I also found that I, uh, emotionally, I was ill-suited to the task. And once the book was published, I returned to the landscape. For over 30 years, I've spent a portion of every single year in the Eastern Sierras. I seek imagery, iconic imagery, that speaks to the fundamental integrity of the natural world. At this time, I devoted my work to a pure vision of nature in the tradition of Ansel Adams and Carlton Watkins and all those who had gone before in the Western School of Landscape. That was the tradition because in their myopic and unsophisticated view of the world, they had a big dividing wall. They had man and they had nature, never understanding that we are an expression of nature and that we are joined at the hip. But at the time, 
as Tom pointed out earlier, having people in your photographs or the works of man <coughs> was a taboo. Hmm. Buckeye Creek, a banner cloud from an early fall snowstorm on Mojave Ridge. Blizzard on Mammoth Path Pass. In 1987, after years of denied requests, I finally got a one-day permit to get on the Crystal Springs watershed here on the peninsula. You remember the picture from Landing Drive. My bedroom window looked straight across the valley at the Sierra Morena, and I dreamed of going back there. And of course, my father told me, you can't do that. Well, anybody who has any kids knows that you want to get your kids fired up, you tell them you can't do that. <laughs> and I spent my lifetime dreaming about that. Over the next 10 years, I spent uh, a tremendous amount of time there with my own permit and a set of keys to live and work there. Made over 10,000 photographs, and this book was published in 1995. The book begins, as a child growing up on a hill overlooking the Sierra Morena Mountains, I had dreams of what secrets might be hidden in their heartland. Dreams of Indians, pirates, and new worlds to explore. During the 40 years that my family has now lived on the San Francisco Peninsula, I have hiked those mountains, explored their creek beds, slept under the stars of summer nights, and wandered amidst the beauty of our redwood forests. It is a place I'm intimately familiar with, but more importantly, it's a place familiar with me. I am what poet, farmer, essayist, and author Wendell Berry might call a place person, and the San Francisco Peninsula is my home. It was at this point in my creative evolution that I began including the works of man in my imagery as an integral part of the natural world rather than some kind of hostile incursion. This particular image is of the original Stagecoach Road that was built in the 1840s. At that time, there were two ways to get from San Francisco to uh, San Jose. One was the famous El Camino Real, and this was the other way. It runs roughly along the, the alignment of 280 and Cañada, and where the watershed, where it crosses the watershed, there's several places where it's truncated by the Filoli property, by Highway 92, and so on. So because of its disuse, the trees have grown in until it's just this beautiful tube of a road that runs along. In 1849, the nine-hour journey from San Francisco to San Jose on John Wisman's stage on this road cost $32 cash or two ounces of gold bullion. <laughs> Reads in water. I frequently get a question. People look at my work and they say, how, how does that stuff show up for you? Well, I like the proverb, all things come to he who waits. And this particular image, I had seen it in my mind a million times, but it required a perfect storm. It required the right season, spring, where the bulrushes were just beginning to come up before they fruit or they send off leaves. It required a maximum amount of water in the reservoir. It required no wind, which for the Highway 92 gap is very hard to come by. And lastly, it required a flat overcast to remove any definition of reflection from the water. So I watched that particular spot for six or seven years, and finally, when the time was white, I was ready, because I had already made the image in my mind. Guess everyone in the room knows Filoli, fight, love, and live. When you own the oldest, deepest, largest, and richest gold mine in the history of California, you too can have a family crater. <laughs> That's how that works. And this is another example. This is a place where 
Uh, I spent Christmas Eve, every Christmas Eve at the Black Tie Gala. My family was deeply involved in the Woodside Village Church and we would go and sing for Mrs. Roth every Christmas Eve when she had her Black Tie Gala in that fabulous ballroom. And uh, in uh, 1959, the same year I was King of the May Day, I stepped up and I sang Silent Night uh, solo. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house and Mrs. Roth uh, doubled her payment to the church. So <laughs> <laughs> that was my claim to fame. And then I went back every year thereafter because of the warmth of our friendship. It was very special. But I knew how I wanted to capture this. I wanted to capture it as I imagined it in the 1800s. I wanted to capture it as a white pearl in a hostile, dark, foreboding world. Keep in mind, when he bought the watershed property, it was still overrun with grizzly bears. It was a very different, very different time. So I thought today's the day, and I sat up on the hill opposite, and I waited, and I waited, and I waited for six hours in the pouring rain for that ray of light to hit. If you look at the proof sheet, again reminding you, this is analog photography. I don't make digital photographs. The ray of light is here, illuminating the left side of the building. The next frame, it's here. The next frame, it's here. And I was shooting as fast as I could run film through the camera. But, you know, preparation meets opportunity. And sometimes you can get something out of it. Crystal Fenn. Moonlight Temple. The stars wheeling about the North Star, which I placed in the center of the circular edifice for them to scratch their images on the film. Very cold winter night around the uh, holiday season. Between 1994 and 1996, I entered a different time in my life. It was a time of terrible pain and loss. First, my wife's mother passed away at the age of 62 unexpectedly. A few months later, my beloved mother passed away at the age of 72. And a week after her passing, I learned that I would lose my 39-year-old sister to cancer as well. This was new ground for us. And it was a real challenge to make the transition at that point in time, I was invited, I was offered a residency at the Jurassic Resident Artist Program on Bear Gulch Road on the western side of Skyline. When I arrived there, I was very deep in grief and used my time there and my art making to heal myself. I decided to part with my traditions and work with a miniature camera using film that is, sent, is blind to visible light, but very sensitive to heat radiation. Sylvan Steps by David Nash, a world famous sculptor in the uh, bed of uh, Harrington Creek. This book also had traces of my, my curiosity and beginnings and endings and life and death. Here we have a new uh, fern plant growing out of a 100-year-old redwood stump. Witness. And Grace. In March of 1999, after a month of working in Verona, Italy, supervising the printing of uh, the 18 Days in June book, which, by the way, uh, I worked, uh, everybody worked pro bono on it. Robert Haas, who was President Clinton's poet laureate, wrote the introduction. I provided the photography. Designer, publisher, editor, uh, Dale Jirasi and the artist program raised the money to have the book printed. So this book has been a tremendous fundraiser for the uh, resident artist program. So when I came back from supervising the printing, I did what I always do, which is I packed up my Volkswagen camper with all my camera equipment, some books, some music, some food and wine, and took off for the Southwest Desert. And I was there for several days, 
And there was something very, very wrong, which was I wasn't having any fun, wasn't experiencing any of that tangible joy that I usually felt when I was behind the camera. So one night I decided I just have to stop and you know really look at this. And uh, I thought about the Chinese proverb, uh, if we do not change our direction, we are likely to end up where we are headed. <laughs> and I can see that if I didn't find some new way to be, some new way to think, that my future was going to look exactly like my past. And in that moment, I decided that I would surrender the use of cameras, lenses, computers, and black and white film. I woke up the following morning, and frankly, I was a little terrified. I'd been married for a long time, had some young children, and after years and years of struggling, I thought, how can I go home to Julie and tell her, hey, guess what? You're not going to believe this. Now that we're making some money and succeeding, we're not going to do that anymore. You know? <laughs> but I knew I was on the right track because I was really excited. That was the beginning of this portfolio, Through the Green Fuse, from the eponymous poem by uh, Dylan Thomas, The Force That Through the Green Fuse Drives the Flower. As I continued to work in the desert in the way I used to, I started having dreams at night. Dreams in which I saw, well, what I saw wasn't so much important as I felt like in my dreams that life was becoming present that there was some new distinction in my vision where life itself was showing up. And my curiosity was such that I turned myself over to it when I got home. After two years' work, 3,000 sheets of 8 by 10 inch film, this portfolio was born. Alstromeria, also known as Peruvian lily, Cordideria Salawana. One of the things I like about art is the mystery of it. And I was in a hard place with these. I was just making the images and people, well, what is that called? Well, when people see a new distinction in photography, the last thing you want to do is tell them what it is. So I hired a biologist friend to tell me what the Latin botanical names of these plants were. And that way, held the mystery in check for a while. <laughs> Eucalyptus polyanthemus. I invite you to come up and see an original print of this after we're done this evening. Lilium species unknown. One of the great moments of my life was when I read the LA Times review of the exhibition at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and the critic said, this he thought this was an image from the Hubble telescope. <laughs> well, I thought I had arrived. As a result of the support that we enjoyed from the family of Bill and Sonia Davidow, we were able to mount this exhibition. Santa Barbara Museum of Art now owns the entire collection in this magnificent 40 by 50 inch format. A couple of years later, Bill, David Out, took me to Santa Fe, where I had the privilege of meeting some of the people at the Santa Fe Institute, which is a private, nonprofit, independent research center that specializes in complexity science. They were as intrigued with my cameraless images as I was with the work they were doing, and was over the moon excited when they called a few weeks later and invited me to move to Santa Fe to become the second artist in residence in their 20 year history. Needless to say, I accepted. With three years and the Institute's support and my family's support, I entered the most creative and productive time of my entire life, producing 36 images uh, during that time, all of them inspired by the flora and fauna of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Hopi Dye Sunflower. <coughs> Mahog 
mahogany melange. Eryngium matrix. Hmm. This image, more than any of the others, makes me think of the Santa Fe Institute and its inquiry into the nature of complexity. This was a hard one image. I was in uh, Durango, Colorado on a weekend doing a little fly fishing to get away from work. And I think very in a very linear way, something I have to be on guard against. You know, one, two, three, four. The world doesn't happen like that, as we all know. The world is very chaotic. So I always had this idea about aspen trees. At first they're green, then they're yellow, then they get red, and then they turn a little black, and then the leaves fall off. And as I was driving back, I saw that that wasn't anything of the sort, that you have a variety of different colors uh, amongst the groves. So I took out my loppers and cut, 50, uh, cut one branch off of each of 50 different aspen trees on the 200 mile drive from Durango back to Santa Fe. And when I got to Santa Fe, I picked one leaf off of each branch and then I imaged it to a formula so that they would be consistent. And then I printed them all as a single image with the intent of capturing the whole phenomenon of Aspen turning. At the same time, I was working at home uh, in my home in Montero. Rancho Corral de Tierra is the name of the Spanish land grant where Montero is situated. And uh, by the way, the reason that these are named for these various areas, I can only work with living plants. Some plants lose their beautiful iridescent ultraviolet aura within an hour of being picked. So you don't have the luxury of cut flowers, you don't have the luxury of, of you know, shopping or storing up. You have to work with living plants now. Most of these were imaged with the root balls intact. This parrot tulip. Russian river oak, we collected this uh, on a very special trip when we dropped our youngest off at college. And between Julie's sobbing on the way back home, uh, we realized we were empty nesters. And uh, we were having a, a bite to eat next to the Russian River on our way back from Eugene, Oregon. And Julie found these and she said, isn't that beautiful? You know, life and decay. And I felt like it was just a beautiful fit for us at the time. Nasturtium blossoms. Trillium in bloom. I like to say you don't need to believe in heaven if you've ever seen a hum hummingbird. And these plants are a reminder of that. These things are at our feet every day when we have time to take a look at them. White clematis from the garden. And rainbow chard. As you might guess, I'm a, a passionate gardener. One of the things that I been able to do is I grow plants specifically for imaging. So in this case, instead of growing the chard for 60 days and eating it, I discovered that if I grew them all summer long for six months, that the colors in the stem would build up and build up and build up and build up. People can't believe that these are natural colors. They always think they've been photoshopped or manipulated. But you grow them long enough and you get a fabulous array of colors. One of the challenges of this work, of my cameraless work, is there's no feedback. It takes days to get the film processed. There's no meters. There's no viewfinders. I work in total darkness. So the only way I can see where the plants are is by feeling them on the film. So it's not like traditional photography where you can look and take a shot. I mean, in the case of our digital cameras, we can look and go, oh, well, I don't want that. I want it a little different. There's none of that. So what I started doing was I started using my native black and white media as kind of a, a way to get a Polaroid. So I'd make the image on black and white film, process it, and within 15 minutes I could see, oh, I've got a winner, or don't waste time with that. So it kind of guided me. And years into it, I looked at all the black and white work and I discovered that it could really stand on its own, like this piece, Citrus number seven. 
fiddleheads, Mabel Duet. One evening in the summer of 2007, after I'd gone through a period of about 18 months watching my health decline, having my family watch my health decline, I was trimming uh, cardstock in the darkroom, and I looked down, and there was these beautiful spirals of paper. And something clicked in my mind, and I started imaging them. And I was halfway through doing that, and I thought, this is very strange. This is not my medium. This is not my vision. What's going on here? But I spent the entire evening out there making these images and put them away and forgot about them until I discovered them in the drawer several years after having been diagnosed with acute neural Lyme disease which is occasioned by spiral bacteria just like this. <laughs> and I'd seen five doctors, all of whom got the diagnosis wrong, and it got deeply ingrained enough that it disabled me. I passed it to my wife, and she and I have both been disabled since, uh, excuse me, since 2007. So it's been a, a profound life-changing experience and I wish I had just had the, the wisdom and foresight at the time to see what I was making in the darkroom to give me some, some guidance. We make plans and God laughs. By early 2008, I could no longer take care of myself, drive a car, work, or be left home alone for my own safety. And that continued for a couple years. In 2010, I started thinking about that forest behind my house on Lane and Drive, and I started becoming very fearful that what if I lost my passion for making art in a way that I couldn't recover it, just like I couldn't recover that forest. And at the time, I was on the advisory board of, of Semperverance Fund, and we were invited to take a hike on Jasper Ridge. That resulted in this portfolio, Chasing the Light, morning at Jasper Ridge. At the time, I was too infirm to work for more than an hour or two a day. And so I would go at sunrise and work for a couple hours and go home. And I was very frustrated and I kept thinking this isn't working. But when I looked at the work, all the work was shot at the exact same time of the day. So it created kind of a beautiful stitching together of what was happening in my life at that time. Here's a beautiful example of what happens when nature's undisturbed. Spreading oak. Some of you may know Jasper Ridge is a research center globally known for its research in global warming. Streaming cobbles on Corte Madera Creek. Bedrock mortars. Of course, we all know the Ohlones were here before us. This is one of the many sites where the community would grind their foods. And at the same time, I spent a lot of time trying to find solace and beauty and peace as my life had pretty much been turned upside down and found it in an image like this, Cattail Ballet. Overtop, Searsville Dam. In 2013, there was a big flood and the dam itself overtopped. The sluices couldn't empty it fast enough. So I walked out on the dam with my, the water up to my shins, pointed my camera straight down the cascading water and captured this image of beauty and power. <coughs> uh, I have continued to do my cameraless work, though it's proven to be uh, extremely difficult. Um, black and white photography has 14 variables. If you count every variable, the chemistry you use, the kind of film you use, the kind of camera you use, shutter speed, aperture, the kind of paper you print on, the amount of exposure you get. So about 15, 16 variables. This process has over 50. So I can juggle black and white photography still, but this work proved to be a real problem. And the work began taking on 
a very chaotic look, which at first, it was actually Julie that saw this piece and she said, my God, that's beautiful. But it didn't have the order and the structure of the work I'd done before I'd fallen ill. But I came to embrace this as a new artistic vision for where I am now in my life. Field mustard, fallen lichen. This piece of lichen fell on my shoulder during a residency at Jurassic in 2009. And I imaged it, and I was amazed at how it looked like my brain felt from the damage I received from the Lyme infection in my brain. In fact, it hangs in my doctor's office, and people often say, how did you get that picture of that brain? Bougainvillea? <laughs> <laughs> When is Madeira born of a desire to take flight? It was a period where I took lots of, made lots of images of things that were broken, because that's how I felt. This broken sea glass and gopher and bull bones collected from an owl pellet from our, the forest where we live in Montero. But with the light of life shining through, always present. In 1993, shortly before his untimely passing, Wallace Stenger, who assisted me in getting uh, the writer for my first book, The Unseen Peninsula, wrote, hard writing makes easy reading. And that really resonates for me. Over the last 40 years, I've seen that that's true for me as well. For me, hard shooting makes for joyful viewing which is the main reason that I don't care to work in the digital format. In closing, I'd like to share something else that Wally wrote, this time from the introduction to his collection of essays, The American West is Living Space, because it fits, it fits me well. If there is such a thing as being conditioned by climate and geography, and I think there is, then it is the West that has conditioned me. It has the lights and forms and colors that I respond to in nature and in art. If there is a Western speech, I speak it. If there is a Western character or personality, I am some variant of it. If there is a Western culture in the small c anthropological sense of the term, I have not escaped it. It has to have shaped me. I may even have contributed to it in some minor way, for culture is a pyramid to which all of us bring a stone. Thank you very much. I think we'll have a minute for some questions. Sorry for leading you astray like that. I usually uh, explain those photographs, and I found that it doesn't really serve the viewing experience. It's a little like having a poem explained. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you how I make these images. I take a living plant into the dark room. I turn the lights off. I put it on my imaging easel, which is a flat piece of sheet metal wired up to an 80,000 volt uh, Tesla coil discharge device. I then take the plant, I lay it on the film uh, in the way I envision it in my mind, and I pass 80,000 volts of electrical current through it. That's what creates the beautiful ultraviolet edges of the subject. If I stopped there, I'd have a black sheet of film with those ultraviolet tracings. So the next step in this light painting is I take a fiber optic probe that's the diameter of a human hair, a little bit smaller. And if my hand is the plant and it's laying on the film that's had this electrical pulse run through it, I take the fiber optic probe and I paint with white light the backside of the plant. Some of the light is reflected. Some of the light of it is absorbed. So I'm casting a shadow of the plant on the film. But if I hold the light there long enough, 
the light penetrates the plant and exposes the natural color of the plant to the film. So they are essentially paintings or uh, photographs made with light and electricity that use the plant both as the source and the filter for the energy that's passed through it. Can you see the colors appear right away? No. You have to wait till later. No, it, that's why it took 3,000 sheets of oh, film nice. to finish nice. the first 25 <laughs> images. So it's a very, very uh, risky approach. High risk, high reward. Film's $40 a sheet, you go through 3,000 sheets of film. It's, it's, uh, that's, but that's the joy of it. This is a, a, a courageous expression, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and um, I'm glad it's worked out as and well. And you have a dead plant. Uh, not always. Some of the plants actually get replanted and live. It all depends on how fragile they are. So, other questions? Yes? It seems like you must, maybe every photographer spends a lot of It was incredibly intimidating, you know. Uh, Murray Gelman, the author of The Cork and the Jaguar, Cormac McCarthy, the author of The Road and No Country for Old Men, and too many wonderful books to mention. Uh, these are big hearted people. These are people who seem to have gotten where they were by being inclusive. Uh, being only the second artist was uh, very intimidating. The requirements were simple. I had to attend lunch and tea every single day because that's when the cross-pollination happens. And uh, if, you, if you weren't at lunch and tea, they would ask you to leave. Uh, and then each time I arrived, I'd have to give a presentation. And every time I left, I had to give a presentation. Uh, but these, these are not men and women who regard ignorance with shame. That's what I would say. If you're curious, you want to learn, come on board, you know. And it's not an educational institution. They're, they're doing very high level research. But uh, it was a real eye opener for me. Yes? How did you arrive at this technique of doing a camera imaging? Well, I, I, uh, I appear to be the only one doing it. They don't make this film anymore. They quit making it in 2008. So it's kind of a dead art at this point. Um, the first photograph ever made was by uh, Sir Fox Talbot. He took a piece of paper, he painted light sensitive silver salts on it, put a plant on it, put it outside in the sun, let it sit for eight hours. He picked it up, peeled the plant up, and oh my god, here's a perfect rendering of a botanical specimen. And as he watched it, it all turned black because he hadn't figured out how to fix the image yet. <laughs> but that was, so that's what I'm doing. He was using sunlight, I'm using state-of-the-art color film, fiber optically delivered light, and high voltage electrical discharges. Um, the high voltage electrical discharges, that is known as Kirlian photography, named for Alexander and Simeon Kirlian, who are Russian parapsychologists who believe in uh, the spirit life, uh, crystals, you know, all that kind of thing. She was a, a kindergarten teacher he was an, electron, uh, an electrical repairman in Leningrad, which is where the Soviet Union had all of their research going on. So he was always fixing electrical devices. And they learned about the aura from the spirit world. We all know about the aura and, and ghosts and all that kind of thing. And one day, he got badly electrocuted. And he saw this ultraviolet arcing around his hand. He said, oh my gosh, I've seen my own aura. And they both quit their jobs and spent the next four decades trying to prove that the ultraviolet light that you see around my images is in fact the spirit life of the plant or the person. And it's a, a, I can see why they spent their life doing that. <coughs> I have plants that have lost their aura in 30 minutes after being cut. So when you see that, it really makes you wonder. I make so, no such claims. I'm just delighted that the work invites the conversation. Yes? Were you doing your acrylic work when you had Lyme disease, and do you anticipate doing any more of it? I'm doing very little of it. I have about, uh, 
Well, I have about 4,000 sheets of 4 by 5 inch film and about 400 sheets of the 8 by 10 inch film, which is my preferred medium. And I have been for eight years hoping that I would get better enough that I could take on some major project. So per perhaps large, going to the islands, you know, and doing tropical plants, which would be beautiful. I mean, your large pieces of abstract. Are those, the, are, have they gone to good homes? Oh, yes, they have. Well, we do them, we do, we, we try and make the work as available as we can. We do, in the color work, we do 10 prints that are in a small size like this. Then we do 10 that are in a medium size like this. And then we do five that are, you know, four by five feet. And yeah, we've got work in collections all over the world. And the work's been written up in Geo and National Geographic and Wired. And, and uh, I have a total, uh, well, let's see, 1999, so 17 years work. I have about 120 finished images. And, uh, you know, shameless self-promotion. I have a website, Biltman.com. <laughs> I also want you to know, I imagine some of you have friends that are serious photographers. I've been invited back to the Jurassic Resident Artist Program this year to lead a, another week-long workshop where we all get together, we make cameraless images, we make digital images, we photograph meteors at night, we have a delicious gourmet meal every night from our chef, and it's just the 10 of us up there on the mountain. Oh yes, there's flyers in the back about that. So if you've ever wanted to have a residency at the Artist Program, it's by application, but you know, it's open. And uh, we'd love to have you or your, your family and friends come up. And uh, I don't have any galleries in the area right now. I've got galleries in, in uh, Palm Desert and Denver and Santa Fe and Boca Raton, but uh, don't have any exhibitions up at present. Yes, Tom? In looking back at your career, is there anything you would change about the path you've taken and where you've arrived? None. None. <laughs> Chronic illness is a terrible thing, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But I will tell you, the things that bother most of us are not worth that. Mm -hmm. And when you're chronically sick, especially when your partner is, you get a perspective on life that I think only being very, very old provides. I'm in my 60s now. I'm, I'm grateful that I've learned what I've learned. And we spend a lot of time in our Lyme community trying to support other people that have the illness. And, uh, uh, but no, I wouldn't change a thing. Julie and I got the long end of the stick, didn't we? <laughs> we did. Yes, we did. Okay. Yes? What's next for you? What, what's inspiring you as an artist? What's, uh, what's next? Um, well, what's next is my son's wedding, actually, <laughs> which has occupied all of my attention and time. But uh, creatively, I'm really not sure. And it's been that way for quite some time. I have the only remaining supply of this film in the world. And I want to put it to good purpose. But this is also not a medium that lends itself to casual engagement. You have to do it every single day. And with very few exceptions, I just haven't quite had the gas in my tank to do that. So I'm trying to be patient. But, you know, uh, 15 years ago, there were 30 places in the Bay Area that could process this film. There is now one. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles had over 100. There are now three. So, and Kodak has gone belly up. They, make all, they have all the proprietary chemistry. So, uh, so, so time is short, and I'm walking slow. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> and now, Ralph, why is the film not available? This is a kind of film that we used to use when I worked for Architectural Digest and Interior Design. We shoot a room like this uh, for you know for publication on the eight by ten inch camera, so you get super high quality reproduction, and it's sensitive to the kind of light energy that incandescent and fluorescent bulbs put off. A lot of the light energy in incandescent bulbs is in uh, wavelengths that we can't see in the ultraviolet. So there's no need for, for that kind of film. Nobody shoots with eight by 10 cameras anymore. Everybody shoots everything digitally. As we all know, if you have a digital camera, you can dial in fluorescent lighting or incandescent or sun lighting with a flip of a switch. 
So, uh, so it's a highly specialized film. The ultraviolet that I referred to, if I use daylight film, that will not register on the film. So I can't use regular color film. If that ultraviolet did register on color film, you could never take a picture outside in color uh, with a blue sky, because the blue sky is awash with ultraviolet. So any normal film has a filter built into the film to preclude sensitivity to that kind of light. So, you know, I'm old and I'm working with dinosaur equipment and like that. Yes? Well, I'm very proud of my conservationalist record. We had uh, dinner last night at the annual Semperverance Fund, uh, on whose board I sat when I got to go to uh, uh, Jasper Ridge. Uh, over the last 40 years, I've participated in the raising of over $400 million and the permanent preservation of over 125,000 acres of land within San Mateo County. So, well, I, I, had the, I had the fun job. You know, I, I didn't have to ask my friends for money. I'd go live out of my camper up on the ridge top for a week at a time and make photographs, which happily inspired people to get out their wallets and give. So we were talking about that on the way over here today after the dinner last night. Um, it's, a, it's time for younger people now and people with the kind of energy and talent and passion that I had when I was a younger man. And I continue to support Post and the Parks Foundation and Semperverance Fund. Oh, in fact, another shameless self-promotion here. Between now and uh, I think the 19th of October, I have an exhibition at the San Mateo County History Museum. And it looks at the five organizations, Jasper Ridge, Jurassic, Parks Foundation, Post and Semper Virens that have been, I've been engaged with this massive effort. So it has a few prints from each of those. Uh, all, it's all black and white landscape work. And that's the museum that's right on Fox Square in Redwood City. So please go down and see it. I would love to share it with you. And I think we're almost out of time if there's maybe one more question. I got Day of the Horse tomorrow. I got stuff going on around here. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. <coughs> Well, we've come to terms with it. Uh, I spend 16 to 18 hours a day in bed, seven days a week. Still? Uh, yes. Wow. And um, if I do that, I can do this. If I don't, I get sick or, in a worst case, get reinfected, which has happened many times and have to go through another two months of IV infusions and so on. Uh, so, you know, we went to bed at seven last night got up this morning, worked through my presentation, went back to bed, got up at four, got here at five, and here we are. So it's a challenge. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure.